Matilda, you're a bio-truther. You're a neurosexist. You're being a biological determinist. You're being a biological fatalist. You're trying to use biology to justify slut-shaming or sexism or misogyny. We've evolved beyond our biology. If you've ever spoken to a feminist or a proponent of social justice about the idea that there may be some biological inclination for certain populations towards certain behavioural trends, or that there may be certain biological faculties leading people towards certain behaviours, or that there may even simply be some sort of biological reason why there are patterns observable within certain populations of humanity, you've probably heard some of those phrases thrown at you, often followed up with some sort of condescending lecture about neuroplasticity, that is, the function of the human brain to adapt according to different circumstances or stimuli within the lifetime of an individual, as if this is something that disproves evolutionary psychology or biopsychology or neuropsychology, when it's actually one of the key cornerstones of it, or as if this is something that evolutionary psychologists haven't thought of when they have, because it's one of the cornerstones of the discipline. And the other common argument that I hear against this is people saying things like, could it be a cultural factor? As if evolutionary psychologists, again, don't consider culture to be part of evolution, which they most certainly do. And these are things that I have often found myself having to explain to people. And all of this coincides with a question that I was asked a while ago, where someone asked me, how exactly do you sort of get into evolutionary psychology? What is the sort of stepping stone that you use to begin to understand it? Because it seemed that a lot of the material was just in massive, hefty university textbooks, or you'd have to just leap straight into the quite in-depth lectures on video sites such as YouTube. And as it happened, I was in a bookshop not too long ago, and this question just sprung into my mind. And so I started thumbing through a book that I found called Evolutionary Psychology, A Beginner's Guide. Because I saw this and thought, hey, well, if you want an easy way in, what could be better to ease you into the subject than a so-called beginner's guide? And as it happens... The very first chapter actually covers these sorts of accusations that you often find people throwing at people who will reference evolutionary psychology or biopsychology online. So I thought I'd just read for you a short excerpt from this book to just sort of dispel some of the fog around this issue, and to hopefully just shed a little bit of light onto this to just sort of confirm for people that no evolutionary psychologists are absolutely aware of the concept of things like neuroplasticity. No, they're not saying that any sort of behavior is genetically predetermined and you therefore cannot escape from it, and that predisposition to some kind of behavior within a population does absolutely not mean that that population is going to behave in that certain way, and that yes, culture and social pressure absolutely can be deciding factors in evolution and behavior. So let's get straight on in here, shall we? It is important to make clear what an evolutionary approach to human behavior does and does not entail. The value of the evolutionary approach is that it provides us with a sound theoretical framework which enables us to generate a set of precise hypotheses concerning behavioral responses and psychological mechanisms and subject them to rigorous tests using data from the real world. We can ask questions about the history and development of a trait both over a geological time, its phylogenetic cause, and within the lifetime of an individual its ontogenetic cause, determine how a behavior enhances survival and reproduction, its functional or ultimate cause, and identify the factors that trigger a particular behavioral response to occur, its motivational or proximate cause. Nico Timbergen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973 for his work on animal behavior, pointed out that each of these questions, while appearing very different at face value, is really just a different way of asking the same question. Why does an animal display a particular trait? With the answer pitched at different levels of an evolutionary explanation. Each of these four senses of why is important, and each can be equally informative, but it is very important not to confuse these levels of explanation 
by providing, for example, a proximate level answer to a question that asks about the function of a behavior. Partitioning the kinds of questions we can ask in this way is now known in his honor as Tim Bergen's Four Whys. By formulating our questions carefully and making sure our answers are pitched at the appropriate level of explanation, we can identify whether behaviors are adaptations produced by the process of natural selection, whether they are byproducts of selection for other traits, whether they were initially selected for other purposes but have been co opted by evolution to serve a new role, sometimes known as exaptations, or whether they serve no evolutionary function at all. In other words, the aim of the evolutionary approach is to understand the advantages that traits confer on individual organisms, how these interact with other traits, for example, how having a large brain means it takes longer for an animal to reach sexual maturity, and how a species' evolutionary history constrains the range of adaptations that are possible. Genetic determinism, the evolutionary red herring. What an evolutionary approach does not involve, however, is any notion that all behavior is genetically determined and that our biology is our destiny. This issue continues to exercise many people, mainly social scientists, but some biologists have also become surprisingly consumed by it. Much of the criticism leveled at evolutionary approaches to human behavior seem to rest on the belief that an evolutionary explanation of behavior necessarily implies that behavior must be genetically determined. At face value, this may seem a reasonable conclusion to draw. After all, most discussions concerning the evolution of behavior are explicitly couched in terms of the gene for a behavior. Moreover, the success of a given behavior is explicitly measured in terms of its fitness, a term from population genetics that refers to the relative number of copies of a particular gene that an individual contributes to future generations. Given this, it might indeed seem to follow that any discussion of evolution must mean genetic evolution. The logic of this argument would appear to be inescapable, but the fundamental question we have to ask is, does it have anything to do with the evolutionary study of behavior? The short answer is no. There is a world of difference between claiming that we can provide an evolutionary explanation for behavior and claiming that we are offering an explanation in terms of the genetic determination of behavior. This is for two reasons. First, no known species of organism, with the possible exception of single-celled creatures like viruses and bacteria, show genetically determined behavior in this way. Behavior is simply too complex to be determined by single genes. More importantly, if a behavior truly were genetically determined, it would mean that the behavior always developed in exactly the same way in each individual, and that environmental influences exerted no influence whatsoever. This would result in behavior that, by necessity, would be completely inflexible. The organism would always behave in the same way, irrespective of the circumstances. Genetic determinism on this scale is an excellent recipe for the rapid extinction of the species in question. It is not a particularly helpful foundation on which to base an effective interaction with a complex, constantly changing world. Vertebrates evolved large brains precisely to allow them to adjust their behavior to suit the circumstances in which they happen to find themselves on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The genes that code the brain have been selected expressly to enable the organism to escape from a genetically driven existence. Ironically, given the fears of genetic determinism and the loss of free will, it is our genes that free us from these deterministic constraints. An evolutionary approach to understanding behavior is most definitely not about identifying a single causal link between genes and behavior. This misunderstanding often arises because an evolutionary approach does require some genes in the system. So convention enjoins us to identify some arbitrary notional gene as the focus of our thinking. The genes in evolutionary explanations are no more than a device for keeping our thinking straight. This does not necessarily mean that there are no specific genes involved, of course, but that is a question that has a purely empirical answer, which must be provided by developmental biologists, not by evolutionary psychologists. Secondly, the evolutionary study of behavior is not actually about the genes that determine behavior. Even in the weak sense, there must always be some genetic constraint on the capacity to behave at all. The point is that an evolutionary approach is concerned with a strategic analysis of behavior. 
Why does the individual behave in this way? In the sense of what purpose does it serve for the individual? A strategic view makes no specific assumptions about what determines behavior. It simply assumes that an individual's choice of behavior strategy is guided by evolutionary considerations. That is, maximizing its contributions to the species gene pool in future generations. The evolutionary approach to the study of behavior raises four separate points that need to be clarified. First, such explanations sound as though, and have certainly been interpreted as implying that animals make explicitly conscious decisions about their genetic future. No organism can do that, not even humans. Rather, this kind of explanation makes no assumptions at all about how such decisions are made. It could be entirely genetically driven and unthinking, but it could equally be entirely learned and deliberate, or it could be anywhere in between. Which of these possibilities is correct is an interesting empirical question, but the answer does not have any implications for whether animals are behaving strategically, or indeed whether evolutionary considerations had a hand in their decisions. Second. While organisms, which behave in a way that increases the number of their descendants in future generations, can be considered to have higher fitness, this does not mean that the actual goal of that behavior is the maximization of fitness. The goal of an ashe hunter from Patagonia may be on one occasion to hunt and kill a tapir, or on another to marry off one of his children and dance at the wedding. The link to fitness can occur very far down the line, and there is no reason to expect people any more than other animals, to show behaviors that are overtly designed to increase their fitness, the number of descendants they leave, even though that is their eventual consequence. The achievement of a much more proximate goal can have fitness-enhancing effects, but there need be no direct link between the two. This extended link via a series of intermediate proximate goals between behavior and its ultimate fitness consequences allows us to explore organisms' behavioral decisions by focusing on immediate short-term consequences, such as maximizing energy intake in the case of hunters, or maximizing the number of offspring sired in the case of mating strategies, while assuming that successful solutions to these proximate problems will eventually carry through into higher fitness. In behavioral ecology, this is known as the phenotypic gambit. Third, the assumption that organisms are designed to behave in such a way as to maximize their genetic fitness is a heuristic device rather than a presumption of fact. It provides us with very precise predictions, which can be subjected to clear empirical tests. In contrast, the criticism of genetic determinism is explicitly focused on the machinery that permits behavior to occur. In effect, what enables the hardware to be produced? This is a how question, and is certainly entirely different from asking why behavior occurs. Fourth, evolutionary explanations are statistical. Perhaps the commonest attempt to counter an evolutionary explanation is, well, my child doesn't do that. A specific example, however, cannot negate a statistical rule. To disprove the claim, you need to show that, on average, children do not behave this way. The statistical nature of evolutionary explanations is important, indeed crucial, because evolutionary change cannot happen if everyone behaves in the same way. Organisms have to constantly test their environment, whether this be physical or social, in order to determine whether they are behaving in an environmentally optimal fashion. Some individuals will inevitably get it wrong, but now and again this trial and error learning will yield a novel solution that is better than all the others. Gradually, this solution will spread through the population, as those who have it, or adopt it, reproduce more successfully. But even so, that solution will never be adopted by everyone in the population. Individuals will continue to try out new ones, and some will continue to get it wrong. In short, the dispute confuses two quite different kinds of question that one might ask of the world. Why something occurs, or how it occurs. The confusion probably arises because the word gene is used in both kinds of explanation. One focuses on genes as causes of behavior, or the capacity to behave. The other focuses on genes as consequences of behavior. That is to say, the effect that behaving in a particular way has on the genetic makeup of the next generation. Although evolutionary biologists keep these two meanings clearly separated in their minds, those who are less familiar with this approach often confuse them. Although these two processes are necessarily linked, it does not follow that in any particular case the same set of genes is both cause and consequence. 
In large-brained organisms like mammals and birds, this evolutionary loop is often closed by the brain. Consider an organism that has a large brain, which enables it to adopt flexible behavioral strategies. This allows it to fine-tune its behavior in the light of current circumstances so as to maximize the number of matings it achieves, thereby maximizing the number of offspring it contributes to the next generation. What is passed on from generation to generation, and so makes both evolution and behavior possible, are the genes for a big brain. But the genes that code for the brain do not determine the behavior, mating, that the brain gives rise to. Rather, it merely determines the capacity to make flexible decisions that are well-tuned to local circumstances. And here endeth the reading. Hopefully that's cleared up a few misconceptions that people may have about evolutionary psychology or biopsychology. When we approach controversial behaviors that are observable in humans, and certain patterns of behavior, and things are stated like saying, well, there is a reason for this behavior because genetically it was at some point advantageous and therefore it is more likely to be manifest. At no point is this being used as an excuse for this behavior. At no point is it being used to justify the behavior or say that it is a correct behavior. It is simply offering an explanation as to why it may be manifesting. And one of the most popular topics that this comes up around is the concept of things such as sexual marketplace value and slut-shaming or stud-shaming or this supposed sexual double standard. When someone delves into the evolutionary psychology behind these behaviors, it is never stating that this is a good behavior, that this is a correct behavior. It is merely the explanation of why the behavior may be manifesting in regards to its phylogenetic cause and its motivational cause. There was a wonderful metaphor that someone actually left on one of my videos when someone accused me of attempting to justify a certain behavior, which I will paraphrase for you now. Person A is in a room. Person B walks into the room. Person B notices that there is a massive hole in the wall. And person B asks, how did that get there? To which person A replies with, a car drove through the wall. Person A hasn't attempted to justify the existence of the hole. Person A hasn't attempted to say that the hole being there is good or correct or right. They are simply stating how it came to be. But if person B were one of these people who likes to go down this shaming route, they would no doubt respond with something along the lines of your wall shaming or your hole shaming, because you're saying that it's good or right because you gave a reason for its existence, which is simply not the case, and is frankly absurd. Anyway, I think I've gone on long enough on this subject, and hopefully that short book reading has managed to whet your appetite to read the full thing. And if you'd like to acquire a copy of it, there is a link to it for sale on Amazon below this video. And no, I'm not getting paid for that link, so don't worry about this being some sort of undercover shill or sponsor deal. It's not. So, thank you all very much for listening. I hope this has been informative, enlightening, and interesting for you. And I will see you all next time.